I'm so happy to introduce Sid Harth to you all today. Um, he comes from one of our six sister schools in India, currently working at Rajkot School, which is along the Ganges River in northern India. And prior to that, he spent most, a big chunk of his life at Rishi Valley School, not just as a teacher and a director, but he came there as a young student um, back in, let's see if I got the date right, uh, 79? Okay, 1979, he was a student in seventh grade. Standard seven, what they called. And yesterday it was really fun to meet a former student of his who came from Los Angeles or San Diego? Irvine. Irvine, right. Anup, maybe some of you met him. Unfortunately, he's not here today, but so Siddharth represents um, this generational thing because Siddharth's students um, are, were here, or student was here, and Siddharth as a student is here, and Siddharth's teachers are here. Mark and Jeff were his teachers when he was a young, so it's a nice generational um, experience to have three, or whatever it's called, the three generations of teachers and students. Um, so another interest of Siddharth besides education is poetry. And I brought his three books, four. One has just come out. And um, it's just a pleasure to enjoy Siddharth uh, around the table and enjoying poetry and together. And um, I wanted to just read this one short poem from his first book called Woodpecker, if I may. I chose it because it reflects the, just the general tone um, of Siddharth's presence, I thought. It captured something quite essential. Virtues. Don't make a virtue, he says, with his eyes far away, of a calm working out, of an all-encompassing smile, inscrutable, benign, statuesque in the wind on a ridge, See lands below, be riven by the cry of a shepherd lost in the trees. Lower your words inside. Come off each pedestal, write. But do not make a song and dance, a red-hot virtue of it. Allow it to play about your lips. And lastly, I'd like to say that in addition to being a teacher and an administrator, a poet, he's a runner. He just returned from the Boston Marathon. And so this haiku came this morning. So with the big welcome to Siddharth, I'd like to read this haiku and welcome you to Ojai and to be here this weekend. It's called Life Marathon, but then I thought, well, they don't really usually name haikus, right? It's just there on the page without a title, but anyway, I named it. <laughs> Above the Ganga, on the tabla of dusty road, beat his strong, sleek feet.
Thank you so much, Karen. That was such a heartwarming introduction. And uh, thank you very much to the KFA for accommodating this session uh, and all the people who are working to make it possible. I'm thinking especially right now of the tech team. I can see how hard they've been at it to make sure everything is smooth. I've been warned not to overshoot my time and I don't want to because we have a further treat of music waiting for us and I'm inclined to use my running skills and run away. <laughs> uh, uh, but thanks to Yap, I might overshoot by a couple of minutes but I'll try not to. Uh, growing up in Rishi Valley from class 7 to class 12, I remember December, January was an exciting time, a particularly exciting time to be there because that's when Krishnamurti would visit as he did all the years I was there at school. And he, during his visits, he'd give talks to the students. And... Uh, I have to admit, as a 12 or 13 year old, or even as a 17 year old, I wasn't one of the most receptive listeners, and I'm not sure how much I absorbed. But I know that some things made an impact on me, and what made an impact on me, I think, was some of the metaphors that he used. In one of the first talks I listened to, I remember he said, Something like, you know, we all build walls around ourselves and because of that we never really come into contact with other people. At the time I heard him say it, it was for me a very literal statement. And I actually remember visualizing people walking around with these sort of balloon-like walls that collided with each other and made it impossible for them to connect. Even at the time, I thought there was maybe something a little nonsensical in the way I was understanding the metaphor, taking it so literally. But now I wonder, maybe there's some truth to it. And I find even now, 40 years later, uh, when I read Krishnamurti or listen to him, what often speaks to me the most directly is some of the metaphors he uses. I began, I, I began to feel that Krishnamurti had a poetic sensibility, whatever that means, and I'll try to unpack it a little bit during this talk. I also discovered later that Krishnamurti had in fact actually written poetry when he was quite young, and it had been published in the 19. Uh, 20s, when he was still part of the Theosophical Society. And uh, I was intrigued by this. I was also intrigued by the fact that later on, it seems, he stopped writing poetry. And yet it seemed to me that there was something deeply poetic about his communication. So in this talk, what I'd like to try and do is to look at one of his poem sequences from the 1920s and see in it, I see in it, seeds of some of the things that he spoke about in what we would consider his mature discourse when he stopped using poetry. I'd also like to make the case that there's something about the poetic mode which can help us approach this thorny question of what is it to understand Krishnamurti? What is it to go beyond the words and to, to whatever extent possible, internalize what he's speaking? So this is my title, Krishnamurti is the Song of Life, which is the name of this poem that I'm going to be referring to. Soul making and poetry. Now soul making needs some explanation. I'll come to that in a minute. And I have this uh, quotation from Mary Oliver, who's a beloved American poet, 
to pay attention, this is our endless and proper work. And I have this here because I think underlying much of what I say and underlying poetry and Krishnamurti, in fact, is uh, what I would call attention. So soul making, and this is a quote from a poet whom Krishnamurti was particularly fond of, John Keats, the uh, uh, British romantic poet, poet, who incidentally wrote some very interesting letters. And this is in a letter to his brother. So he says, uh, you know, there's this misguided notion of the world being a veil of tears from which we are to be redeemed by a certain arbitrary interposition of God and taken to heaven. What a little circumscribed, straightened notion. Call the world, if you please, the veil of soul-making. Then you will find out the use of the world. In other words, suffering or human experience generally is not something that we need to think of as being needed to es be escaped from, but in fact it is what actually catalyzes spiritual growth. I will call the world a school instituted for the purpose of teaching little children to read. I will call the human heart the hornbook used in that school, and I will call the child able to read the soul made from that school and its hornbook. Do you not see how necessary a world of pains and troubles is to school and intelligence? and make it a soul, a place where the heart must feel and suffer in a thousand diverse ways. In other words, the world and all the experience of the world is necessary to be lived through. It's not something to be escaped from, however painful it might be. And this takes us directly into the poem of Krishnamurti that I'd like to refer to. And, uh, the poem is The Song of Life, and it's a 32-section poem. I won't read all of it. I will be referring to perhaps about 10 sections in the poem. And uh, just for convenience sake, I've grouped them under six themes that I identified. These are not exhaustive. I'm sure there are many others we could identify. But these are some themes which I thought are interesting to look at, themes or questions because, as I said, I think they connect very directly to things that Krishnamurti spoke about all his life. So the first theme I have is the freeing of sorrow. Now you might think a more natural title for this would be the freeing from sorrow, but I've deliberately phrased it like this because I think Krishnamurti sees, and certainly Keats did, that uh, there's a freeing action that sorrow brings about. So it's the freeing of sorrow, where sorrow is a kind of catalyst. It's also the freeing of all the usual connotations we have with sorrow. So you free our idea of sorrow from this whole business of something which is unpleasant and needs to be escaped from. And the poem here, which I'm going to read, is section 22. And it's in fact a poem I first came across many years ago and was moved by. And in this poem, Krishnamurti is speaking about perhaps the closest experience of human, one of the closest experiences of human intimacy that he had, which was his very close relationship with his younger brother Nitya. Krishnamurti and Nitya came to Ohai all, about a hundred years ago, uh, primarily to address Nitya's health. He had uh, tuberculosis, and it was felt that this would be a good climate for him. Three years later, Nitya died, uh, while Krishnamurti was in fact on board ship on his way back to India for a theosophical uh, program. And Krishnamurti was devastated when he heard the news. Um, and 
And yet, through that, by the end of it, by the time he reached India, something had changed within him. That experience of sorrow was truly transformative. My brother died. We were as two stars in a naked sky. He was like me, burnt by the warm sun in the land where are soft breezes, swaying palms, and cool rivers, where there are shadows, numberless, bright-colored parrots and chattering birds. He died. I wept in loneliness. Wherever I went, I heard his voice and his happy laughter. I looked for his face in every passerby and asked each if he had not met with my brother but none could give me comfort. I worshipped, I prayed, but the gods were silent. I could weep no more, I could dream no more. I sought him in all things, in every clime. I heard the whispering of many trees calling me to his abode, and then in my search I beheld thee, O Lord of my heart. In thee alone I saw the face of my brother. In thee alone, O my eternal love, do I behold the faces of all the living and all the dead. Now, uh, I find this poem very moving for the utterly simple and naked way in which it unfolds his sorrow and his search for a way out of it. But I'd also like to draw your attention to what happens in the last two stanzas. And there's an interesting change that seems to happen. In the second last stanza, in thee alone, I saw the face of my brother. Let's leave aside for the moment what this thee is or who it is. But in the last stanza, in thee alone, do I behold the faces of all the living and all the dead. So beholding the brother has become beholding all the living and all the dead. There's a movement, it seems to me, from the personal to something much wider, much more universal. And uh, this is, I think, central to Krishnamurti's thought, seeing uh, the universal in individual experience. And in fact, it was something that, this, that Krishnamurti had in mind at the very beginning of this poem, because in section one, make of thy desire the desire of the world, of thy love the love of the world, in thy thoughts take the world to thy mind. Awakened from the heart of love, my voice is the voice of understanding, born of infinite sorrow. So love and understanding, a dichotomy that we'll come back to, but born of sorrow. Again, sorrow as a, as a catalyst. In fact, he then says, invite sorrow. Out of the fullness of thy heart, invite sorrow. And the joy thereof shall be in abundance. And so on. Okay, I, to save time, I won't read the whole thing. But you see, uh, well, in the last stanza, the cry of sorrow is the voice of fulfillment and the rejoicing thereness, therein is the fullness of life. Now, this whole notion of fullness or wholeness is again very central to Krishnamurti, and I would like to come back to it. Uh, but here is another passage, not from the poem, but written the year after Nitya died. And I find this deeply moving as well. He's referring to his brother's death. An old dream is dead and a new one is being born as a flower that pushes through the solid earth. A new vision is coming into being and a greater consciousness is being unfolded. A new strength born of suffering is pulsating in the veins and a new sympathy and understanding is being born of past suffering. A greater desire to see others suffer less, and if they must suffer, to see that they bear it nobly and come out of it without too many scars. I have wept, but I do not want others to weep. But if they do, I know what it means. 
Now, as I said, I find this profoundly moving. And it seems to me that this was really what drove Krishnamurti for the remaining 60 years of his life. You know, Krishnamurti in his later discourse can at times sound detached, even unfeeling. Um, but I think that's an illusion, really. I think it was a, a tremendous compassion for the suffering that people go through. And I think that came partly from his own experience of suffering. Now, this brings me to the second theme uh, I've identified, life in its fullness. I've already sort of referred to it briefly. And there are two poems I'm going to be reading on this. Love not the shapely branch, nor place its image alone in thy heart, it dieth away. Love the whole tree, then thou shalt love the shapely branch, the tender and the withered leaf, the shy bud and the full-blown flower, the falling petal and the dancing height, the splendid shadow of full love. Our love life in its fullness, it knoweth no decay. Now, this is very Keatsian, this whole notion that all of life, including decay, suffering, death, it all needs to be embraced. One thinks, for example, of the Keats of a poem like To Autumn, where autumn, which can appear bleak, in fact contains within it, within it all the seasons and the fullness of the whole cycle of seasons. So here again, to be able to, to, to see the beauty of the whole, including parts that seem withered or decayed, is uh, something worth looking at. And Krishnamurti, of course, looks at this later in the psychological realm. For example here, if you are angry and are concerned with ending that anger, then you focus your attention on the anger and the whole escapes you and the anger is strengthened. But anger is interrelated, interrelated to the whole. So when we separate the particular from the whole, the particular breeds its own problems. Now what is it actually to be able to look at the whole? Uh, that's a question I think worth pausing at and going into. There isn't time maybe to try and unpack it, but I think it's worth remembering Krishnamurti's emphasis on not uh, breaking things up, but instead to seeing how everything is in fact um, uh, connected. Um, and there's, and, and in the field of education, Education is not merely acquiring knowledge, gathering and correlating facts. It is to see the significance of life as a whole. But the whole cannot be approached through the part, which is what he says everyone is trying to do. And there's another aspect to this uh, business of seeing connections between everything. And that is how... Uh, uh, it's in a somewhat more specific way, seeing how uh, specific aspects of the world are interrelated. It's a very, let us say, ecological kind of consciousness here. Does the raindrop hold in its fullness the raging stream? Does the raindrop in its loneliness feed the solitary tree on the hill? Does the raindrop in its great descent create the sweet sound of many waters? Does the raindrop in its pureness quench the aching thirst? It is the unwise who chase the shadow of self in life, and life eludes them, for they wander in the ways of bondage. Wherefore the struggle and loneliness of division? In life there is neither you nor I. So, what, what this poem appears to be saying is that we have the capacity to see everything as a whole, but it's the shadow of the self and the self-acting that seems to come in the way and creates division. 
And as uh, David pointed out yesterday, Krishnamurti was very clear that where there is division, there is conflict. And it's the self, of course, which um, underlies that. Um, there is, of course, a certain mystical aspect to this. That's one way of looking at it. And here are these lines from Blake, which I'm sure are familiar to many of us, um, to see uh, the vastness in the small and so on. Um, and of course, it leads to one of Krishnamurti's profound and, let's say, central statements <laughs> Uh, sutras, you might say, you are the world. The whole of humankind is in each of us, in both the conscious and the unconscious, the deeper layers. One is the result of thousands of years, embedded in each one of us, as one can find if one knows how to delve into it, go deeply inside, is the whole history, the whole knowledge of the past. That is why self-knowledge is immensely important. We are the world, essentially, basically, fundamentally. The world is you and you are the world. Realizing that fundamentally, deeply, not romantically, not intellectually, but actually, then we see that our problem is a global problem. It's not my problem or your particular problem. It is a human problem. So this recognition that there's, that this division we seem to make between ourselves and the rest of the world is a profound illusion is of course very central to krishnamurti and i see it i see it in those poems that we just read uh, a different way of stating it perhaps but i don't think it's uh, radically uh, different uh, also, there's this, you know, when, when uh, Krishnamurti says, realizing that fundamentally, deeply, not romantically, not intellectually, but actually, I think this is something worth exploring as well. What is it to understand something actually, uh, uh, not merely intellectually, not merely romantically, you know, something sounds very nice, but actually. And as I said, this whole question of what is it to understand Krishnamurti or to understand anything really is uh, I think the, the concern I have which underlies this whole presentation. But if you are the world, what about the self? We have a very strong sense of self. There's this very strong sense that there's what's inside and there's everything else that's outside. So uh, I find Krishnamurti implicitly addressing this as well in one section of the poem. And so the question is, if you are the world, what is the self? And look at this poem, I have no name. I am as the fresh breeze of the mountains. I have no shelter. I am as the wandering waters. I have no sacred books, nor am I well seasoned in tradition. I am not bound by theories, nor corrupted by beliefs. I am not held in the bondage of religions. My song is the song of the river calling for the open seas, wandering, wandering. I am life. And it's interesting, the things he says he doesn't have are all the things we associate with identity, right? And with what we might think of as security. Name, shelter, sacred books, theories, beliefs, religions. So I'm not any of these, or rather I don't have any of these. And what I am, he draws on nature characteristically, the fresh breeze of the mountains, the song of the river, the open seas, a quality of wandering, and finally, what he calls uh, uh, life. In other words, I'm everything or nothing. Uh, you know, uh, Walt Whitman says, 
I am large, I contain multitudes. And you have Emily Dickinson saying what sounds like the opposite in this wonderful little poem. I am nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell, they'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. <laughs> so I'm everything as Whitman says, I'm nobody as Dickinson says, but they seem to be saying much the same thing. They both seem to be radically questioning the notion of a separate identity. And of course, um, Krishnamurti was doing uh, the same thing. And here, he here's a passage where he speaks about it a little uh, more analytically. And he relates it to something that Mark was speaking about yesterday when he spoke about the hold of group identities being rooted in fear. Every effort of the self to be or not to be is a movement away from what it is, apart from its name, attributes, idiosyncrasies, possessions. What is the self? Is there the I, the self, when its qualities are taken away? It is this fear of being nothing that drives the self into activity, but it is nothing. It is an emptiness. If we are able to face that emptiness, to be with that aching loneliness, then fear altogether disappears and a fundamental transformation uh, takes place. So this brings me uh, to my next theme, which is what Krishnamurti refers to as the dust of individual experience. So he has no truck with individual identity but individual experience or the facts we face, I think yesterday uh, one of the points that David highlighted was that Krishnamurti was dealing with facts, not with theories or generalizations. As the spark that shall give warmth is hid among the gray ashes, so, O oh friend, the light which shall guide thee under the dust of thine experience. So it's your experience that has to be the light that guides you. You can't be guided by somebody else's. And uh, you, we have to remember that it was just a few years later, in fact, the, a year later, if you consider that this poem was published in 1928, it was in 1929, of course, that Krishnamurti said, truth is a pathless land. It's your experience that needs to show you the way. O oh friend, thou canst not bind truth. It is as the air, it has no dwelling place. O oh friend, leave heresy to the heretic, religion to the orthodox, but gather truth from the dust of thine experience. So truth, like air, cannot be confined. It has no location. It can perhaps be approached through your experience. Um, no, so, but what is it then to understand? What is truth and what is it to understand truth? So that takes us to the next theme, which I've identified, truth and understanding. And look at these interesting dichotomies and again, some, a very powerful metaphor that he uses. Reason is the treasure of the mind. Love is the perfume of the heart. Yet both are of one substance, though cast of different moulds. As a golden coin bears two images parted by a thin wall of metal, so between love and reason is the poise of understanding, that understanding which is of both mind and heart. O life, O beloved, in thee alone is eternal love, in thee alone is everlasting thought. Now this, these dichotomies apparent between mind and heart, reason and love, and it's wonderful the way Krishnamurti reconciles them with that image of the coin, where he says, so between love and reason is the poise of understanding. And I think it's here, this is one of the places where Krishnamurti 
truly becomes a poet in the marvelous use of the word poise because poise of course suggests balance and equilibrium it also suggests um a kind of steadiness confidence i when i was i was looking at it in the dictionary and apparently it's also used as a term in ornithology when describing birds that are hovering and ready to just do something um so a quality of readiness as well so the word poise the poise of understanding which is between these you know uh, thought and feeling uh it wonderfully suggests how understanding is a rich and dynamic thing you can't locate it you know in brain or heart or any one particular place it seems to uh require several faculties and this is the last theme that i'll quickly look at doubt and contentment and again a wonderful metaphor that krishnamurti uses a startling metaphor doubt is as a precious ointment now who would have thought that <laughs> though it burns it shall heal greatly i tell thee invite doubt when in the fullness of thy desire call to doubt at the time when thine ambition is outrunning others in thought awaken doubt when thy heart is rejoicing in great love for the fullness of thy heart and for the flight of thy mind let doubt tear away thine entanglements as the fresh winds from the mountains that awaken the shadows in the valley so let doubt call to dance the decaying love of a contented mind decaying love of a contented mind so uh you know krishnamurti was later to often speak of discontent and he saw discontent as a positive thing because again it's a it's a sort of catalyst to uh you know to awake to awaking and to uh to looking at life and here doubt as a precious uh ointment and again you see how nature invariably plays a positive role in this whole business as the fresh winds from the mountains that awaken the shadows in the valley so doubt comes like a fresh wind is what he seems to be suggesting and this brings me back for a moment to keats and another of his letters and it's uncanny how keats seems to use very similar uh language i tell thee doubt is as a precious ointment though it burns it shall heal greatly keats speaks of what he calls negative capability in one of his letters several things dovetailed in my mind and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement especially in literature and which shakespeare possessed so enormously i mean negative capability that is when man is capable of being in uncertainties mysteries doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason the capacity to remain in uncertainty but i think one needs to qualify this a little because you know uncertainty can arise out of passiveness or laziness you know you're uncertain and you're quite happy to remain uncertain because you just can't be bothered to take the trouble or you're just not interested but there is also i think a a a, a deeper a more active kind of uncertainty which is like insight actually where you're engaged with something and you recognize despite your engagement that there's something you don't know and that actually takes you further into it so so there are kinds of uncertainty and i think it's the second kind that uh, keats was talking about 
And I think it's the second kind that Krishnamurti was interested in also, not the uncertainty of laziness, but of engagement. Uh, and so, just briefly to recap, these are the themes that I've identified from the poem, the freeing of sorrow, you recall, not from sorrow, but of sorrow, life in its fullness, if you are the world, what is the self? How do we understand the self? How do we reconcile these things, the self and this perception that there's no difference between the self and the world? The importance of individual experience, truth and understanding, doubt and contentment. And these are all, I think, uh, central strands in Krishnamurti's uh, later discourse. And uh, I'd like to come now uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about poetry. What has any of this to do with poetry? And what do we even mean by poetry? So let me rely on the authority of a poet I greatly admire and love. And this is the Polish poet, Wisława Simborska. She has a wonderful poem called, Some People Like Poetry. It's a three stanza poem. In the first stanza, she explores some people, and she says maybe two in a thousand or something. And then in the second stanza, she looks at what we understand by the word like. And in the third stanza, which I'm quoting here, she explores what poetry is. So this is only the third stanza, poetry. But what is poetry anyway? More than one rickety answer has tumbled since that question first was raised. But I just keep on not knowing and I cling to that like a redemptive handrail. Now this is deceptively simple. It sounds as if here's a celebrated poet, a Nobel Prize winner, humbly saying that she doesn't know what poetry is, you know, a kind of, a kind of disclaimer. But I think she's doing much more than that. I think what she's indicating is that not knowing is in fact at the heart of poetry, which is why she says she will cling to it. And this is a not knowing akin to the second kind of uncertainty that I was speaking about. And so this not knowing becomes, I would say, a sort of manifesto, if you like, for poetry and for life. Having said that, I think there are some things one can say about poetry. And so I've put a few points down which I shall just read to you without comment. And as you'll see, I've avoided qualifiers like sometimes, always, and so on, because they're a distraction. I would just say that these things are generally true about poetry. Poetry is interested in the unknown and the not noble. It seeks to capture the truth of experience. It begins in individual experience, but breaks boundaries. Its mode of understanding involves heart and head. It sees the large and the small. It sees the inner in the outer. And I guess I could say vice versa for both of those. It works through image and metaphor, concision and suggestiveness. It needs quietness and no direction. I've put that within quotes for reasons you'll see. Its state of being is attention. And you would uh, remember uh, the quote from Mary Oliver, to pay attention, this is our endless and proper work. Now, as you'll see, some of these pointers are about, about poetry are reflected I think are parallel to some of the themes we've identified in the poem that we were looking at together by Krishnamurti. Now the question is, is there poetry in Krishnamurti's later writing and speech? 
not in a formal way. I don't think he wrote poetry or set out to write poetry, but I think his work is deeply poetic. And I, I'd like to identify for now uh, three ways in which it is so, and I'll try to illustrate them, and then I'll close, because remember, we have music coming after this. So uh, one of the ways I think is, you know, this quality of attention, how it comes into his descriptions, his descriptions of people, of places, a quality of utter attention without judgment. And I'd like to try and illustrate that. A second is how sometimes uh, in a particular passage, you find he's saying something and then moving to something that seems utterly unconnected. And if you try and make logical connections, you, pro you would probably fail. And yet, there seems to be a quality of something inevitable about those two passages. And that's often how poetry works. Its connections are not explicit. Uh, its connections are there for you to make if you want to. And the third thing is, of course, in Krishnamurti's continued use of metaphors and very rich metaphors. So let me briefly illustrate, and I'll hear from Krishnamurti's notebook, Rishi Valley in 1961. Look at this description, and this is only a part of it. The earth was the heavens and the heavens the earth, and everything was alive and bursting with color, and color was God, not the God of man. The hills became transparent, every rock and boulder was without weight, floating in color, and the distant hills were blue, the blue of all the seas and the sky of every clime. The ripening rice fields were intense pink and green, a stretch of immediate attention. And the road that crossed the valley was purple and white, so alive that it was one of the rays that raced across the sky. You were of that light, burning, furious, exploding, without shadow, without root and word. And as the sun went further down, every color became more violent, more intense, and you were completely lost past all recalling. It was an evening that had no memory. Now, you know, there's a kind of shimmering quality to this, you know, like in a Van Gogh painting, where these colors are just sort of merging and the, and the, the observer seems to get merged into, into the painting almost. I don't know how else to describe this. Now, to me, this is very poetic because of the quality of attention that uh, underlies it. But look what is to follow. Immediately after this, every thought and feeling must flower for them to live and die, flowering of everything in you, the ambition, the greed, the hate, the joy, the passion. In the flowering, there is death and freedom. It is only in freedom that anything can flourish, not in suppression, in control, and discipline. These only pervert, corrupt, Flowering and freedom is goodness and all virtue. To allow envy to flower is not easy. It is condemned or cherished but never given freedom, and so on. Uh, until finally, he says, when it has shown itself completely, there is an ending of it. Now, this is an example of the second thing that I said I find poetic in Krishnamurti's work, which is that there is no explicit connection between the previous paragraph and this one. You may ingeniously make some connections between flowering and the colors in the sky and so on, but I think that would be to reduce it. What I feel, however, when I read these, is there's something utterly true and inevitable in the way the second paragraph follows the first, and that's enough. One doesn't have to establish a logical connection between them. And that's so often how poetry works. And finally, 
some of the key metaphors in Krishnamurti, and here are two which are very central to his thought, and I've drawn them deliberately from a very late talk, 1985, a few months before Krishnamurti died in Washington, D.C. Uh, well, this is another passage, but I won't read it because we are short of time. So here's one, taking a journey together. This is something which Krishnamurti so often says, even in the audio that we were listening to today, he keeps saying something like it. I won't read it, you can read it for yourself. Okay, okay, I'll read it. <laughs> I was just trying to save time, yeah. Yeah? Okay. If one may point out, you and the speaker are taking a journey together, a long, complicated journey. To take that journey, one mustn't be attached to any particular form of belief, for then that journey is not possible, nor to any faith, nor to some conclusion or ideology or concept. It's like climbing Everest or some of the other great marvelous mountains of the world. One has to leave a great deal behind, not carry all one's burdens up the steep hills. So in taking the journey together and the speaker means together, not that he's talking and you are agreeing or disagreeing, if we could put those two words aside completely, then we can take the journey together. Some may want to walk very rapidly and others may lag behind, but it is a journey together. And, and you know, in a good metaphor and a metaphor like this, which is sustained, what you might call an epic metaphor, sometimes you get, you, you sort of lose yourself in the richness of the metaphor itself. So this climbing, the leaving of things, the need to leave things behind and so on, it's a wonderfully rich metaphor, and it seems to speak uh, so much. Another metaphor related to the mountain that Krishnamurti used often was when he speaks of what mediocrity is. He says, to be mediocre is to go halfway up a mountain. Uh, and the other, the other metaphor, which is a very, uh, which occurs very frequently in Krishnamurti, is of course this one, which we are all familiar with, the mirror of relationship. So I'll read one example of it. Uh, I'll just start from. To look at ourselves very clearly, accurately, precisely, is only possible in a mirror of relationship. That's the only mirror we have. When you look at yourself combing your hair or shaving or doing whatever you are doing to your face, that mirror reflects exactly how you look. Psychologically, is there such a mirror in which you can see exactly, precisely, actually what you are? As we said, there is such a mirror which is one's relationship, however intimate it be. Whether it's with a man or a woman, in that relationship, you see what you are if you allow yourself to see what you are. You see how you get angry, your possessiveness, all the rest of it. Now, I think for those of us who have any kind of interest in Krishnamurti, we are familiar with this metaphor, but it's a wonderful one. I mean, I find myself, I've, you know, at times taking it almost for granted because it seems so familiar. But I think it's worth pausing at it and sort of being attentive to the richness and depth of this metaphor. And I'll conclude now with two final metaphors uh, because they are very closely connected to things we've looked at already. You remember Keats' Keats's first passage that I wrote where he says, you know, he says the world, the world is like a school and uh, you know, children read, learn to read the human heart, and that's what makes a soul. And Krishnamurti uses a similar metaphor to read the book of life. 
To learn from books is important, but what is far more important is to learn from the book of the story of yourself, because you are all mankind. To read that book is the art of learning. The book is not out there or hidden in yourself, it is all around you. You are part of that book. The book tells you the story of the human being and it is to be read in your relationships, in your reactions, in your concepts and values. The book is the very center of your being and the learning is to read that book with exquisite care. I love that phrase, with exquisite care. The book tells you the story of the past, how the past shapes your mind, your heart and your senses. The past shapes the present, modifying itself according to the challenge of the moment. And in this endless movement of time, human beings are caught. This is the conditioning of man. This conditioning has been the endless burden of man, of you and your brother. Education is the art of learning about this conditioning and the way out of it, the freedom from this burden. So this reading of this book of life. And the last metaphor, which is closely connected to this in an interesting way, quietness and no direction. Now this is from uh, in Sanan in a question and answer uh, session. Somebody asked Krishnamurti the question, what does it mean to read this book instantly? Because K had said that. And this is K's response. Now when you have a map of Switzerland with all the lakes and the mountains and all that, the beauty of the land, if you have a particular direction from Gristad to go to Bern, you're only concerned with that route. You don't look at the rest of the map. But if you have no direction, then you look all round. The moment you have a motive which gives you a direction, then you are only looking in a particular direction. But if you have no motive and also no direction, then you look at the whole map at a glance. Now can you do this the same with one's self, anger, jealousy, brutality, aggression, attachment, all that? That is the whole map of yourself, which requires quietness of the brain and no direction. This is what I had quoted earlier. Then you see clearly the whole of it. You hear the whole tone of that history and you have captured it immediately, the wholeness of it, right? Have you got it? So, so again, this focus on the whole rather than on a part, which he says will only happen in a state of quietness where you have no direction. And finally, he says, right? Have you got it? Now, that really is the question. How do we get Krishnamurti? How do we know if we've got Krishnamurti? How do we know if we've gone beyond intellectual understanding? And that's, that's not easy to answer. But what I would like to say is that I think somewhere in a kind of mediation between heart and head and underpinned by a quality of attention, somewhere there, there is, you know, what he calls the poise of understanding. And I'd like to say finally that, you know, if you come to the theme of this gathering, what are you looking for? What is it you're looking for? Again, that's not an easy question to answer. Because there are things we think we should be looking for. What are we actually looking for? We don't always know. And I'm not sure that it's the brain alone that can answer that question. I think other faculties come in as well. So I've overshot by four minutes for which my apologies. Thank you. Thank you very much.